Welcome everybody to this webinar and uh, about uh, underwriting cyber risk for large industrial enterprises. My name is Jose Seara and I am the founder and uh, CEO of the Nexus. Uh, our mission at the Nexus is to build the global standard for industrial cyber risk quantification of industrial enterprises and risk transfer market. Uh, this webinar will be hopefully the first of a series in the topic where we will be uncovering the challenges and opportunities in this market with uh, different industry experts. Uh, so let me introduce uh, the panel of experts uh, today. We are still waiting for some uh, panelists to join. Hopefully she joins uh, any minute. So uh, beginning with Chris, uh, Chris Storr. Uh, Chris is the head of uh, Cyber Center of Excellence at Minery. Chris is a senior executive manager at Minery and the responsible for its uh, Cyber Center of Excellence. Uh, serving global and North American uh, reinsurance clients. Prior to that, Chris uh, was Chief Underwriting Officer and Global Head of uh, Cyber Risk Community. Uh, thank you, Chris, for joining the panel today. Thank you. Uh, we had scheduled the participation of Jeffrey Sir, but some last minute unfortunate circumstances didn't let him join us. Uh, and Peter Armstrong has taken that seat. Uh, Peter uh, is an expert in management of cyber risk uh, and cyber security and a self-professed cyber and risk management geek. Peter runs his own cyber risk management consulting uh, practice. And uh, prior, uh, Chris was the senior subject, excuse me, senior cyber subject matter expert at Mini Regroup. And uh, before that, uh, Peter led the Willis cyber risk consulting business where he focused on the quantification and management of uh, cyber exposure in the risk portfolios of large organizations. He has served on the Advising Cybersecurity Conference Advisory Board. Uh, Peter's background is in the defense, intelligence, and security sector, with a particular focus on industrial control systems and operational technology. Uh, Thank you, Peter. Uh, impressive uh, background, uh, both of you, uh, Chris and Peter. And uh, Libby Bennett uh, from AXA XL um, was supposed to join. Uh, unfortunately, I suppose that she has some technical glitch. Hopefully, she can join uh, any minute. That's it. Let's kick this off. Um, we have just come out of a complex uh, renewal season. Uh, Chris. Uh, what is the state of the market for insurers and reinsurers? And what are the lessons that you have learned? Uh, so thank you, uh, Jose, and, and, and hello to everyone. Um, as, as Jose mentioned, I'm uh, waving the, the reinsurance flag today and uh, representing the, uh, the reinsurance side of the, uh, the, the value chain. So uh, just to be clear, essentially my clients are, are cyber insurers. And uh, that means I'm a, a little bit more removed from the from the action as Libby, but uh, as a consequence of working with many different insurers, uh, I'm afforded a, a fairly broad perspective of the cyber market uh, as a whole. Um, so in, in terms of the, uh, the state of the market through uh, a reinsurer's lens, um, we had a, a large renewal period at the 1st of January where around 60% of our cyber reinsurance tra treaties renewed. And uh, I would uh, characterize the, the renewals as uh, fairly, fairly turbulent, uh, but not necessarily dissimilar from what we've experienced in the market over the last 18 months, uh, particularly as insurers really wrestled with short-term profitability and, and concerns around uh, systemic risk. And uh, what we've seen, uh, which was quite reassuring, uh, was uh, a strong reaction from the market, uh, bringing in significant new underwriting measures which was very necessary as each underwriting year has developed less favorably in the market since uh, 2018 with uh, deteriorating profitability driven largely by uh, ransomware losses. Uh, so action was, uh, was really required, uh, but the response was, was very positive and, and a sign I think that uh, cyber as a line of business is, is, is really maturing. And uh, it almost feels as if uh, cyber has successfully navigated uh, elementary school and, and uh, you know, we're now facing the more difficult years, really trying to find our, our place in the world. Um, 
you know, so what we saw in the renewal, renewal was a, a lot of remediation uh, action from insurers with a, a real focus on correcting portfolios and recreating conditions for sustainable growth. And this included uh, significant rate change, um, you know, where, where premium really grew. Uh, we saw a reduction in, in uh, deployed limits, additional underwriting process, particularly around ransomware and the, uh, the purging of suboptimal risks. So certainly from a reinsurance perspective, this was received uh, as, a, as a very positive development. You know, we have an increased level of confidence in the, the portfolio of our clients. Uh, they have a higher quality uh, standard of risks. Um, they've reduced volatility within their portfolios and they've added a, uh, an additional robustness to their, to their performance. Um, what is difficult to gauge, however, at least with absolute confidence, is, uh, is the development of the ransomware trend. Uh, so usually ransomware losses take two or three years to develop, so it's, it's hard to be overly confident. However, we've seen positive early signals from some insurers that the situation is, is improving, and this you know, we, 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 we take as a, as a positive. And that's uh, where I would say we start to see the, the bigger differences in the market. And, and uh, you, know, you can more clearly differentiate between those that initiated the remediation activities early and those that were very consequent in their re-underwriting actions and those that perhaps were a little slow to get things going and weren't necessarily as strict in the application of those measures. So in, in terms of lessons learned, um, those that did identify the loss trend uh, quicker those that were able to act and respond in a more consequent way, uh, these are the insurers that now are best positioned to, to really exit this remediation phase and to, uh, to really start to think about growth again. Thank you, Chris. I have a follow-up question, but uh, thank God uh, we were able to uh, bring Libby to the, to the meeting. Thank you, Libby, for joining and apologies for the technical glitch. Uh, Libby, let me first introduce Libby to, 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 the, to the audience, uh, Libby, uh, Libby Bennett. Uh, she currently serves as the Global Chief Underwriting Officer for AXA Excel uh, Financial Lines. Uh, Libby oversees the global product strategy for direct and indirect uh, cyber, employment practice, liability, and professional lines from an aggregated global product view. Uh, thank you, Libby, for joining the panel. Good to be with you all. And uh, Libby, uh, uh, I had a question for you and for Chris. Uh, Chris has already answered the question, but uh, let me let me phrase the question for you, if I may. Uh, uh, we have just come out of a really complex renewal season, uh, probably one one of a kind. Uh, what is the state of the market uh, from from where you see the market uh, for insurers, and uh, mm -hmm. what are the lessons? What are the lessons learned? Yeah, I think there's probably two major. Uh, elements that are driving the market today. One is what is our expectation of losses in the in the go forward position. So 2019, 2020, to some extent 2021, we saw uh, loss activity greater than we expected. Anytime that happens for an insurer, we second guess whether the um, our forecast of what losses are going to look like are correct or not. And for sure, we did not collect enough money in 2019 or 2020 or 2021 in order to be able to sure, ensure we cover those losses in the future if they behave the same way. So we've got to get those loss costs correct in order to price the product properly to stabilize the pricing of the product, which is tricky because unlike property insurance where we're dealing with natural perils, in cyber insurance, we're dealing with threat actor and changes in threat actor behavior. So that's sort of one dimension. Um, I think the second dimension that's going on is that because of um, the volatility in the losses, meaning the uncertainty about what the losses are gonna look like, so we, how do we know we're collecting enough money? The new capacity or new capital is not coming into the marketplace to pick up on um, the rate conditions that we're seeing today. So we have a finite number of carriers that will provide capacity for cyber insurance, and we don't see new money coming into the marketplace right now, which does mean that the um, future of the next year or so is pretty much going to look like it did last year. So I don't, I don't see, you know, what we call softening terms coming in the near future in terms of the next year, I would say. 
Yeah, thank you, Libby. We will talk about capacity uh, later, but I have a follow-up question for Chris. Chris, you mentioned, I took a note here, that uh, ransomware takes three years to develop. Could you please help us understand that? Uh, sorry, Jose, I missed the last part of the question. W yeah, yeah. you, you mentioned that uh, ransomware-related losses take two or three years to develop. Yes. Could you please could you please help us understand why it takes so long? So I think this is this is just the the, the development of that of that particular loss profile. So I think uh, um, you know usually it takes um, insurers and reinsurers that amount of period to really understand how how those losses are developing. And I think the the, the reason why it often takes a little bit longer is also to factor in things like business interruption that might occur as a, as a consequence of a, of a ransomware um, incident. So, um, you know, the the, the ultimate uh, loss amount can can really develop over over a period of time. The loss then needs to be adjusted. And then by the time that uh, that sort of feeds through the, the value chain is, and, and is reported to uh, uh, to, to the reinsurers, this can take up to up to three years, or at least that has been uh, our experience uh, to, to date. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. I think it's important for the audience to understand that uh, that long uh, uh, period between something happens and something gets clear. Thank you. Um, dig back in on Libby's comments. The demand for cyber insurance will continue to grow uh, as digitalization of the business is increased. Uh, for additional capacity to meet the demand, the market obviously needs to be attractive. Uh, however, the insurance and reinsurance markets have suffered significant losses in the last uh, years, as Libby mentioned. Um, uh, but also, uh, more targeted underwriting questionnaires are being uh, used, such as, for instance, including ransomware-related questionnaires. Uh, will these developments, Libby, will these developments be enough to attract uh, new capital into the market? My personal opinion is no. Um, and the reason I say that is because these are still proxies for the cyber maturity of a business. Questionnaires are a point in time. Outside in scans are a point in time. They are they are indications of cybersecurity and maturity of a company, but we don't get to see the inside of an organization. They keep tend to keep that, um, you know, close to the vest until we have the ability to really see how um, secure a company is. I think um, that is one thing that is keeping capital from coming in is the the lack of really good clear certainty around the risk. The other part is the talent pool. You know, there are not that many of us, A, that are in cybersecurity and even less in cybersecurity insurance. So it's a very small pool of talent that is that is um, needed to, to encourage and expand the market. So we would have to train up a lot of underwriters and um, security analysts to be able to expand i think the the talent pool who can do the underwriting so that is actually a, a constraint on growth as well yeah good point uh, so you do not think that uh, improving those questionnaires is going to make a difference not on their own i i think we have to continue to work in our industry on taking the technological data that is being used by companies for their own benefit and their own understanding of their security and bringing that into our underwriting process so we can continue to evolve our understanding and our maturity in understanding the risk. At the end of the day, our job is to set the price, the terms and the conditions so that we have a stable market. Um, we're in the job to pay losses, that's what we do. But if we can't understand the risk, then you're going to have this uncertainty that you're seeing right now. And I think that we have to continue to work on that. Now, questionnaires, we, do, we use questionnaires, right, Jose? I mean, that's part of our business, but um, and we do use them, but I don't think they in and of themselves are enough. I think we need to do more. Thank you, Libby. And uh, Chris, how do you look at the same problem from the reinsurance uh, position? 
Um, yeah, I mean, Jose, if we, we take a step back for the for a moment, I mean, uh, you know, cyber continues to have a very strong strategic importance, uh, you know, to, to, to our industry, um, you know, to, to really stay relevant as an effective uh, risk, risk management tool. So I think, you know, there is a strong desire across the whole industry to continue to offer meaningful solutions, you know, for a risk that, that probably is the most important enterprise risk a, a company can, uh, can, can face at the moment. And, you know, certainly the, you know, the digital transformation that we've seen accelerated over the last couple of years, this has only added to, to, the, to the needs of our clients. Um, you know, the question, as, 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 as Libby um, asked, is, is really how, how can we deliver on this opportunity, um, you know, as, a, as an industry? And, and, and I think that requires, you know, insurers, reinsurers, retrocessionaires, alternative capital as well, um, all pulling in the same direction. And, um, you know, interestingly, if we, if we look at the value chain, um, you can see already a sizable proportion of the risk has already been transferred via reinsurance. So around 40 to 50% of the market premium and the corresponding risk is ceded to reinsurers, um, which is three or four times more than property or casualty products, albeit on a, on a high absolute number. So I think this tells us a lot. This, this tells us that... Um, the direct market is still on a on a learning strategy. They they see the the upside. They see the 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 strong strategic importance, but there's also some caution about the downside, and, and in particular those large systemic events and the and the aggregation of, of, of losses. And uh, for me, this is where the, the the real problem lies. It's 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 everything Libby mentioned in terms of uh, a, a deeper understanding of of of, of risk. Um, but it, it, it's also about the understanding and modeling of those of those peak scenarios, which I think is really key to, to unlocking more more capacity. And, um, you know, when I think about other lines of business, you know, where our understanding of, of, of perils is, is, is much more advanced, you know, we can we can diversify our portfolios. We can we can spread risk across industry segments, geographies, and this helps us manage accumulation. And, you know, the best example is is, is property where. You know, you might have an earthquake in, 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 in San Francisco, um, but we know with a high level of probability that you would very likely not incur any meaningful losses in, in, in New York. I think the situation with cyber is, is much more challenging, you know, because we, we know these geographical boundaries don't necessarily apply. You, know, you can have a widespread event that can impact companies of all sizes and all geographies. And um, you know this is where we're still learning. In all honesty, it, it, it is a learning strategy for many for many insurers, for many reinsurers. Uh, you know this is where we still need to, to better understand how losses correlate uh, and how we can develop a higher level of sophistication um, in our in our models. And uh, until then, and until we have that better understanding, um, you know, unfortunately, there will be a natural limitation in terms of what the market can offer. Oh, terrific! Thank you, Chris. Uh, now let's change gears and talk about insurance products and uh, processes. So um, cyber risk is arguably a much more dynamic risk compared to traditional risks uh, that are currently insured. Uh, should there be a different way to underwrite this risk, Libby? Yeah, I do think there should be a different way. I, I think you know the, the models that we're seeing out there with um, the insure tech sector where they're doing um, ongoing monitoring of the risk and then notifying the policyholder when they see a problem so they can fix it is one model that's, I think, um, a really good one and a very proactive one. And that works for small business when um, the small business owner might be outsourcing their security to an MSSP it gets more complicated when you're talking about a mid mid market or large corporate or an industrial risk where you know they they have their own security personnel um, and you know ongoing monitoring the last thing the CISO wants is the insurance company in there monitoring their their um, security so i think we have to develop um, a combined way of uh, understanding the the changing risk within a policy year but we need to do some work. That's not, um, it, the small business segment has, has figured it out. It's a little more complicated on the mid to large corporate or industrial side. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Libby. And, and Chris, again, from the reinsurance uh, standpoint, uh, 
do you think that uh, you need to take a different approach to underwrite this risk? Yeah, I, I would. I would absolutely uh, agree with 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 Libby's comments. I, I, I think you know, cyber is is clearly unique and and um, you know, unlike any other exposure that um, you know that the, the insurance industry consumes. And you know, just the the risk of change is is, is so significant. And, and you know, again, to to use a, a property property analogy, it's almost like insuring. Uh, a steel factory uh, for fire one day and then overnight it, it's sort of turning into a factory made of wood and, and being much more susceptible to to, to a loss so um, you know I don't really believe the traditional insurance model necessarily works for for, for cyber I think uh, you know we need to adapt our approach we need to look at new ways to make these exposures uh, in, in insurable um, the good news is, as Libby alluded to is I think there has been a lot of positive innovation in this direction. I think some of it has come from within um, the industry, from, from traditional insurers, but I think we also see new impulses from, from outside, uh, from, from the tech world, um, the, the insure tech community is, as, as well. And I think one of, the, one of the interesting developments around business models, I think um, you know, a lot has been done to, to really change uh, the relationship that we have with with our insureds, um, you know, and providing a much stronger service component, um, you know, beyond risk transfer, and this was partly already started in the the early two thousands when you know certain insurers started offering uh, breach response services uh, to support uh, insureds in the event of data breach. But I think what we've seen more recently is is insurers looking beyond breach services and more in the direction of, of, of risk mitigation, you know, essentially offering a broad range of um, risk management services um, to, to, to really help the, the insureds and, and for them to become better risks, more resilient risks. And of course, the, the upshoot of that is that uh, the insurer has uh, higher quali uh, quality risks in, in the portfolio. Um, I think also the, the, the tech side um, also presents interesting, interesting uh, developments. I think we've, we've seen this outside in scanning technology become more prominent in the last couple of years, uh, particularly as a response to, uh, to, to, to ransomware. Um, and, and, you know, this, this has become uh, a, useful, a useful tool for, uh, for insurers in, in, in terms of risk selection. Um, but certainly our ambition has to go beyond this. And, uh, you know, I don't want to, to, to repeat uh, what, what Libby mentioned, but, uh, um, you know, really to, to, to sort of get beyond the firewall, to, to, to get that real time view, um, you know, to, to, to really um, to, to have that inside out perspective of, of risk. I think this is this is what we have to uh, this has to be our ambition. And, uh, you know, if we can achieve that, I think that can really revolutionize how insurers look at risk and, and uh, you know, move from a, a qualitative perspective to a more evidence-based uh, data-driven approach. Okay, thank you, Chris. So let's talk about data. Uh, uh, to model the cyber risk, evidently data is key, uh, but this is a new risk uh, uh, and this is a new life for you. So everybody's facing the same challenges to access relevant data. Uh, so, so let me begin this time uh, with Peter. Peter. Uh, uh, Chris mentioned outside in data. What are the type of the, I'm sorry, and Libby mentioned that questionnaires are not sufficient. So what other type of data do you think is necessary to assess uh, and model this uh, risk uh, for, for large industrial uh, uh, enterprises? Okay, so um, first of all, before uh, I get into the detail of that, uh, of that question, I wanted to reflect on that uh, previous point, where I thought both Libby and Chris were reflecting on the uh, mat maturation and evolution that is required. But there is an important point to reflect, which is that a new strain of ransomware doesn't usually materially affect the values that are at risk. And that means that we also need to ensure that the discipline of management of cyber within the broader context of risk management is an important component. And for each of those in a more traditional environment, then clearly we uh, take that inside view. So as both Chris and Libby have said, getting inside the firewall and having meaningful um, real-time view of the, of the risk is a critical a uh, critical step forward. In, in relation to the, uh, the data itself, if we think about um, 
uh, one of the critical uh, issues in digitalized businesses. We've got massively disaggregated value propositions across multi-cloud with lots of different third-party digital service providers. And the simple question is, how can you know enough to be able to get close enough to the risk to be able to price in a meaningful way and to choose the risks that should be attracting the increasingly limited capacity? And that's about visibility, which means you've got to be able to see the nature of uh, the risks in those uh, processes. And you've got to be able to quantify the issues that they uh, that they generate. You need to have knowledge. And here I mean about the nature of the configuration. If we think IoT data rich devices in edge based uh, cloud environments, you need to know the configuration state of those devices in order to be able to have a sense of the quality of the, uh, of the risk. But you also need uh, to have the level of surety that the control mechanisms that you know are queried very deeply in the questionnaires that have evolved you need the level of surety that those uh, control frameworks are being applied in a meaningful way in order to have a sense of confidence that um, the things that we are being told as underwriters are being done in fact are being done and so that raises important facets about how technology can take on some of the burden. Chris mentioned this, and it means relying upon relatively new innovations in terms of technical architectures like zero trust architectures. If you don't comply, then you can't connect. Well, you've got to have the surety that that kind of thing, that kind of thing uh, brings. So visibility, insight, data, knowledge, insight, data, and surety of the effectiveness of security outcomes in the context of the control frameworks are key kind of big hands full of the data uh, that is required. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Chris and Libby, are you getting that type of data now? Um. We, we get point in time data. So we, we, get, we get some level of that in the underwriting process. Um, in our world, there are there's uh, two different types of underwriting. You have the primary underwriting and you have the excess underwriting. And so if you're a primary underwriter, you're gonna have probably a deeper um, level of information than you might have on the excess, it depends. Um, but I would not, you know, I, I like Peter's vision because <laughs> um, that would be a great a great place to be in a year's time, let's say. Um, we just aren't there. And I think that's a partly, part of the problem is confidence with the, the company itself, the insured itself feeling comfortable sharing that information with its insurer. You know, it, it, you're, you're looking at the company's crown jewels, right? The most important, um, uh, assets and they are naturally um, reluctant to let outsiders see that. Um, I, I don't think we actually, on one level, I don't think we actually care about seeing the actual assets. What we need is the translator that will help us have that confidence that Peter talked about. So that's I think that's the opportunity we have that the people who are working with inside an organization plus their consultants and what have you are able to take that information, translate it so it's secure vis-a-vis -vis the customer, the client, but that is then shared with the insurance company so we can properly price the product because if we don't understand and we don't price it right, you get exactly what you've been experiencing in the last two years. So. That's the evolutionary journey I think we're on. And Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I wholeheartedly uh, I, I agree, Libby. I, I think, um, you know, um, this is something 
to aspire to. And, and, and I think it's, um, it's actually important when we think about how the line of business, um, you know, matures. And, and, you know, I don't want to be um, Captain Obvious here, but I think, you know, data is, is, is really king in, in, in this respect. And, um, you know, I think perhaps in the past, cyber underwriting was considered perhaps a little bit more art than than science but i think we're we're really fast approaching a point now where the uh, where the scientists start to, to 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 take over and um you know the 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 power that data has really to to transform our decision making process so i think there will still need to be expert judgment there will still need to be experience um but you know the ability to to quickly identify to to understand to respond to to claims trends you know to be able to use predictive modeling um, you know, these aspects will give us additional lenses to, to look at things like risk assessment, pricing, accumulation, portfolio steering, you know, some of the challenges that we've that we've already spoke about. So um, I think there's a there's an opportunity that that, that we have to grasp. And I think um, it will relay relieve, excuse me, some of the pain um, that we've that we've seen in the last couple of years in terms of that procurement close process, being able to better differentiate good risk from bad risk. I think. As, as an industry, perhaps historically we've uh, um, you know we've we've um, overpriced good risks and under underpriced uh, bad risks, and I and I think this gives us an opportunity to think about how we uh, how we offer products and, and solutions to, to clients in a perhaps a more more dynamic way. Oh, terrific! And uh, it seems that there is consensus that one of the I mean we need data, and there is consensus that one of the problems to get access to data or the challenges is confidence. Uh, Peter, you've been in both sides of the risk. How do you think that we, as an industry, can earn that confidence level from the from the stakeholders? So it's um, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you know there's uh, the, there's the scale of world peace and hunger with the problem that we're trying to uh, uh, that we're trying to um, trying to tackle uh, tackle here. Um, so. When I when I think about um, you know the challenges that we are facing, you know both Chris and Libby have uh, have, have already articulated the challenge of the volatility of, of losses on the uh, on the primary side uh, and the constraint in relation to uh, to the capacity and generating confidence at the reinsurance level and at the alternative capital markets is something that is uh, is is critical and what what does what does confidence uh, mean in that uh, in that sense it's about the level of surety that the levels of expectation for a performance in mitigating risk is being delivered that's not to say that there's an expectation of uh, of there being no risk left, because of course we know that's not uh, that's not possible. But that having decided that there is an acceptable level of loss, how do we then ensure that there's a level of surety in the uh, controls frameworks and the underwriting mechanisms to ensure that there is sufficient confidence within the alternative capital markets to be able to um, uh, start to satisfy some of the uh, some of the capacity uh, some of the capacity needs. What is clear is that the ability to be able to quantify cyber risk and relate that to values at, uh, at risk is an important capability that needs to be held both within the insureds and within the uh, primary uh, within the primary underwriters. And it's probably time. Uh, and to Chris's point about you know bringing the science to uh, to this, it's probably time to say, look, the very dynamic nature of the threat means that the probability of occurrence of these incidents is trending to one. And if that is the case, our task is to be able to quantify whether or not the incident is going to be material or not material. And so, quantification of cyber risk both for the uh, insurer and for the insured 
becomes a central capability and simple truth is for other critical enterprise risks. That's what they do every day. They quantify the exposure and then within the context of risk appetite and tolerance, make decisions about what the most effective way is to deploy their risk capital for risk interventions. Do I spend on some tech or governance? Do I retain and fund it through the captive or do I uh, approach the insurance market and do some uh, some risk transfer. But there's no escaping a requirement to bring science, technology, easing the burden and quantification to the core of this problem. Thank you, Peter. Let's talk about capacity again. Uh, uh, it's clear that there is consensus in this group that uh, the cyber uh, risk uh, transfer market cannot reach its full potential with the current access to capital. And I think that there is consensus in the industry. Um, arguably, uh, getting access to alternative capital uh, from the ILS market is one potential path forward. Uh, Peter, uh, how do you think that this would work with the traditional insurance and reinsurance markets? So I I, it's clear that there is a um, capital capacity crunch um, and uh, Libby talked very clearly about uh, the volatility of the losses that's meaning that there is an absence of capital to be able to take up the nature of the rates um, that's you know trying to take the market to rate adequacy that has been missing over the last several years but Chris also mentioned something around uh, the retro session is the simple truth is that as we start to look at um, the uh, retrospective view of ransomware as an example um, there just isn't the retro capacity that's available and we uh, have to bring some level of confidence to the alternative capital markets such that there is an ability for the reinsurers reinsurers to be able to spread their risk to the ILS marketplace and it, it strikes me that one of the early things that we're going to have to uh, recognize is the need uh, to bring some level of formality together around um, providing uh, industry loss um, um, uh, data that can bring some level of alternative capital perhaps through uh, ILWs. It's going to have to provide a level of protection for uh, business interruption because you know that's what the the asset owners and the risk owners uh, absolutely need and it's going to have to be uh, affirmative cyber because trying to wrap your arms around the silent cyber even with the affirmative regulatory pressures is that's just not going to happen in the short term but we have to be able to provide the confidence to the alternative capital markets to make retro available so that we can see uh, some level of um, a recognition of the dynamic uh, transition of the scale of risk within uh, treaty portfolios in particular, uh, and to get access to that retro uh, capacity. So that means having real um, uh, industry loss capabilities with real industry loss uh, data with meaningful uh, parameters that uh, can trigger those industry loss um, uh, instruments with ILWs giving access through structured uh, information and data to the retrocession uh, capital. And yeah. if we can't do that, I don't know how we're going to tackle the capital crunch. And we see ourselves facing the issue that the world has gone digital, it's busy going cloud, and the insurance world is finding it increasingly difficult to underwrite digital risk. That dog don't hunt long term. Yeah. Uh, Libby and Chris, are you seeing any increasing capacity for you as insurers or reinsurers coming from that alternative capital market these days? I, I, I see a lot of chatter about it. I don't actually see people putting them, you know, their money down. Chris, what do you see? Yeah, very similar, Libby. I mean, I, I'm afraid this is not an area where I have, I have a great deal of, of, of experience, but, um, you know, um, obviously there's been some, some discussion 
um, in this direction already for, for, for quite some years. And, and, and I think it's necessary. You know, I see an important role for alternative capital as, as, as cyber continues to evolve. And I mean, it's clear we will run out of uh, runway at, at some point unless we can, you know, dr dramatically evolve, um, you know, our understanding of some of these uh, peak scenarios. Um, you know, uh, I, I think the the important thing is if, if there is a solution, it has to be a solution at scale. I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're not needing another sort of, you know, 25, 50 million here. Uh, I think we're talking yeah. about you know, a, a significant uh, amount of uh, additional capital. And, you know, I remain hopeful because in, in many ways, cyber is not, you know, so dissimilar from, from other lines of business like, like property, where, you know, there are risks that are transferred to ILS markets. You know, there are peak accumulation scenarios like natural catastrophe, where some capital uh, relief is, 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 is needed. So I would, I would remain hopeful that solutions out, are, are out there. And, and, and I think we as an industry have to be prepared to work with, uh, you know, uh, alternative capital providers to, to really find, uh, find a sensible way to, to, to pass on some of those exposures further down the value chain. Okay, so, so in one hand, there is increasing demand for capacity. On the other hand, the capacity is not growing uh, a lot of ILS alternative capital conversations to bring that capacity. But as you mentioned, Chris, it's not about adding a few million dollars of additional capacity. It's about doing that at a scale. So uh, Peter, probably you have the most experience there. What do you think needs to happen to enable this risk for alternative capital at scale to uh, increase that capacity in a, in a meaningful manner? So in, in some respects, uh, Jose, we've been talking about the core elements already, and that is um, the uh, visibility, um, the knowledge and the surety of the quality of, uh, of the risks, uh, whether that's at the front end with the uh, primary and uh, excess writers or whether it's at uh, the reinsurance. Uh, at the reinsurance uh, uh, end. Um, there is a very great desire within the alternative capital markets to find alternative instruments with uh, better returns. And um, the potential for returns uh, to the um, ILS uh, investors has moved in the last 12 to 18 months from what was probably 3% to 10% rate online, even higher uh, potentially. So the level of returns are beginning to become uh, meaningful for those providers. And so the incentive to want to make it work uh, is, is greater. If we were to take, um, you know, one of Chris's major um, treaties, uh, or a sequence of his, uh, of his treaties and reflect upon the level of uh, accumulation of similar type uh, of risks where the insureds are maybe all in the oil and gas sector. Um, and take a view of the quality of that risk on the basis of what is known about those insureds when the treaty is formed. Um, the nature of the quality of, uh, of the risk in the treaty becomes known and it will either be good or it will be bad and over time we would anticipate that it will, uh, that it will uh, improve. But if we are able to be smart enough about articulating the nature and scale of industry loss within sufficiently constrained boundaries, then we do have the opportunity of providing the confidence that we'll see that alternative capital come into the market, particularly at 10 plus uh, points rate on uh, rate online. But it's about confidence. And that goes back to those three things that cascade all the way through the value chain, which is visibility, knowledge, and surety of the, of the quality of, uh, of the risk. And they're applicable in slightly different ways wherever you are in the value chain, but they're consistent and they're coherent. Um, and if we're able to make those the cardinal points in the generation of um, 
alternative capital instruments, then that capital will flow because the appetite is there and the returns are there. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let's move now into uh, the scope of the protection pricing and the conversations between risk owners and risk takers uh, and the dynamics of those conversations. Um, discussions uh, between the parties evidently uh, uh, focus on the terms of the policy and the pricing uh, or the premium in that policy. Uh, these discussions can cause real uh, friction between the parties, especially in a hard market uh, that we are that we are living in. Uh, Peter or Chris, Libby, please uh, jump in as, as you as you think is necessary. Is this just something that is part of the negotiation environment, or there are other ways to manage this or to look at this conversation dynamic between the parties? Jose, I, I would start by uh, by saying I, I never get asked these questions in soft markets, only during hard markets. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I would make a, a general statement and, and, and say that the current process for procuring cyber insurance can be particularly painful for buyers. And, you know, I think that's partly a reflection of the of the market situation that we that we touched upon. The growing pains, if you like, and, and I hope that will will ease to some extent in, in, in future. But I think it also probably goes beyond this, you know, particularly for, for larger organizations, um, you know, the collection and presentation of, of risk information. This can be particularly problematic, you know, whether it's an application form, a questionnaire or even a more detailed underwriting meeting. I mean, this can, can be an incredibly hard process for, for, for risk managers to, to, to manage. So I, I do think there's there's perhaps room to do better. Um, you know, I believe there's technology solutions that could make this uh, this 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 problem less less painful. We talked about the the inside in solutions uh, earlier, and I think that you know to to some extent could could shortcut this issue. Um, but I think there's also probably a, a room for a more concerted effort within within the industry to to stand to standardize, excuse me, the, the type of information that we're uh, that, that, that we're asking from from insureds, and you know, I, I remember a conversation last year with with a broker complaining about their client being required to fill out ten different ransomware applications for a single placement. And you know, clearly, this is something we can we can do better with. Um, but in, in in terms of pricing and and, and coverage, I, I'm rather more uh, skeptical there in 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 terms of uh, what we can do, um, at least in terms of the. The industrial segment. I think you know generally uh, these are very large procurement uh, transactions. You know with significant sums of money. Um, you know where there is a necessary due diligence, there is need for for negotiations between between the the parties. Um, I would also have my doubts to what extent discussions around. Um, coverage can also be streamlined. I think there will always be some need for industrial clients to bespoke their, their policies to, to really dovetail with their specific risk landscape. And, you know, I think to that extent, there will always need to be some form of negotiation between insureds, brokers and, 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 and insurers. So in my view, um, yes, probably some work for, for us to do as an industry, but also perhaps to some degree, Know part of the uh, the rough and tumble of the of the negotiation environment, as you as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Libby. Yeah, I was thinking about Chris's comment, and you know, I, I think the industry offers a series of coverages, right? And then somebody wants to come in and buy something slightly different, and and whatever they want to they want some carve out or what have you and then we are back to the data point <laughs> so if we've not done that coverage before and we have no data on what the losses could look like and we don't have the visibility and we don't have the knowledge we don't have the surety that Peter has talked about you're asking us to put a coverage grant out and put a number to it and then you know of what you want to spend Right? It's usually you have so much money that you want to spend and you're asking us to take all the risk. And that's why those negotiations are so tough because you know it's our dollars that we're putting up. You could put your own dollars up, <laughs> right? 
but you're looking to transfer that risk to us. And sometimes we just don't have the knowledge to be able to price it properly. And that makes us uncomfortable. So our opportunity here, as we've gone through this conversation today, is to recognize how each party, what the problems that each party are trying to solve for come together and evolve this discussion with one another so we both can get our, our problem areas fixed because the insurers have the information, we have the, the structuring knowledge and know-how, and not only that, but we are crisis managers for a living. We know things fail, right? So when you have an auto accident or your building burns down or whatever, the insurance industry is a crisis management capability and we're that way in cyber as well. And we're happy to do that. But when you ask to take on risk that we don't completely understand or we haven't seen before, or we haven't priced for it, that makes those, those conversations a little bit tricky. Peter, what do you think? So it's uh, it's funny. I'm reflecting on what both you and Chris have uh, have, have said. Um, in the industrials, these are large transactions with big sums at risk. And uh, you know, paraphrasing uh, what you were saying to Libby, you know, um, we are putting our money where the client's mouth is, and that requires a level of discipline in order to be able to get to the uh, to the ground truth. But these conversations are going to happen anyway, and, and my sense is that we need to create a, an environment that gives the freedom of manoeuvre to have those conversations because the outcome is a benefit to the client. This is a business opportunity. Sure, we're talking about management and mitigation of downside risk, but the opportunities are tremendous. If we think about you know, one of the super major oil organizations and we think about their third party risk in their tier one supply chain alone we're talking billions of dollars and if we're able to quantify that exposure in a meaningful way and by meaningful i mean evidence-based and auditable then we give that business the opportunity to put that value somewhere on the capital landscape we can get them to put it in the captive we can give them capital opportunities that start to create the conditions where the 5%, the 10%, the 2% becomes rounding errors in relation to the incremental opportunity. If you can generate six, 700 basis points on the cost of borrowing capital, you can buy a heck of a lot of firewalls for that. So create the opportunity, the business opportunity within which the discipline conversations have to take place because, as Libby says, it's our money and it's their mouth. Uh, thank you, Peter. I, I, I really love that uh, spin um, looking at this protection as something that comes to place only when there is a loss event that day everybody's hungry. Uh, uh, this this could be looked at and probably should be looked at as a business enabler. Uh, that's that's a whole different conversation. Uh, that reminds me, Peter. You and I have talked uh, several times about the relationship between cyber and ESG uh, mandates. Uh, do you mind to elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. So. Um... In a previous life, I, uh, I had responsibility for having to synthesize the relationship between safety case and the operating license and safety case and security case with the operating license in civil, uh, in civil nuclear. And uh, the context was that there can be no safety if you don't have assured levels of security in its broadest sense. But here we want to think about uh, about uh, cyber security. And that meant that the operating license was linked directly to effectiveness of security outcomes. Now, there's an obvious parallel here as we see the imperatives of the ESG agen agenda uh, being applied particularly to the investment community for uh, responsible uh, investments in all of the facets of ESG. And if we think about cybersecurity, the surety of it, the absence of it, the implications for the mandatory reporting and ESG um, 
compliance are profound because essentially we are talking about operation operating license links to ESG expectations and compliance and the surety and the confidence of that compliance to a large degree right across E, S and G uh, has some level of influence from cybersecurity. It, it looks therefore that in the context of the investment marketplaces in particular, and we were talking earlier about um, uh, incremental capacity into the marketplace, that the level of attraction uh, actively around ESG instruments, and we've seen uh, Beasley establishing a, a, a syndicate in Lloyd specifically around, uh, around that, that there is inevitability that there is going to be a linkage between ESG, ESG investments, ESG instruments, and the role that cybersecurity has to play in the ability to meet mandatory ESG reporting. So the, if I take a, a two to three year view of what constitutes the exogenous influences uh, upon the capacity and the capital marketplaces for cyber, ESG is going to be one of the major uh, strands of that. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, Peter. Uh, we are almost at the at the mark uh, on the hour, and I want to be respectful of the time. Uh, but but I feel obliged to ask you one last question. Uh, unfortunately, we live in a different world today than ten days ago. Uh, from the insurance standpoint, in general, and cyber insurance in particular, uh, I'm really interested on on how you are seeing things uh, unfolding, uh, Libby and uh, and Chris. Uh, thank you, Jose. I, I mean, I think, first of all, our thoughts are really with all those directly caught up in the events in, in the Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's really a, a human tragedy what we're, what we're witnessing on our TV screens. And, you know, we can only hope the situation eases as, as quickly as possible and people get the help they need. Um, but, but coming to your question, uh, Jose, and the sort of matters of, of, of insurance, um, obviously, this is a serious risk management exercise for, for all insurers. And, brings about all sorts of, of issues that uh, extend far beyond cyber, including, you know, ensuring compliance with, um, you know, financial sanctions, um, et cetera. But, um, you know, cyber and, and, and specifically cyber war uh, are areas of concern in this particular uh, situation. Um, but before, before I touch upon cyber war, I think it's important to say a few words um, in general about systemic risk, um, because I think it's important to, to, to make clear these types of exposures, this is not about risk appetite. It, it's much more of a, a fundamental risk management topic for, for, for insurers. And what I mean by that is, is you know, systemic risk is, is you know, it's, it's a poison that uh, the industry can't digest too much knowingly and really has to be in, in, in very small doses simply because of the the potential impact to 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 our to our solvency you know so there are some systemic risks like earthquake you know that can be modeled that, that can be insured but only on a very selective basis with you know a natural limitation in terms of what we as the market can can digest in terms of losses but there are also other scenarios where you know the downside is so severe and and the risk so um, systemic that you know individual insurers or, or even the market as a whole you know simply can't digest losses of that of that magnitude and this is very much the case with with traditional war and and, and also specifically with, uh, with 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 cyber war you know where there is a real risk of an escalation of losses stemming from highly sophisticated state actors that really could put insurers at risk as a, as a going concern. Um, so there's absolutely no intention for these types of risks or, or losses of this scale to really be covered by, by, by cyber policies. The challenge that, that we have is that the, the, the current war clauses in the market that we, that we see within cyber policies, these date back to the 1930s, and, and they simply need to uh, evolve to really reflect the, the, the world today. But of course, the exercise isn't, isn't an easy one. It's, it's, it's a highly complex topic. 
it's not a straightforward exercise. You know, for example, how does one characterize a cyber war? You know, how does one attribute, um, you know, an individual attack to, to a specific uh, state actor? You know, how do you determine what an appropriate threshold is for, for, for a cyber war? So these, these are all highly complex topics. And, um, you know, the market is working on, on clarifying uh, wording around this issue. There was a, a, a recent proposal by the, uh, the Lloyd's Market Association, which personally I like as it affords as much coverage as possible to insureds, but, but also looks to exclude losses of a, you know, with a very high threshold for insurers. Also, we've seen moves by uh, US insurers, uh, and, and they've come out with uh, alternative proposals, which are also very workable. But my personal view, uh, and, and, and obviously uh, the events in Ukraine also focus the mind, um, is that this is a very time critical topic. Uh, you know, firstly, for buyers to have certainty in, in, in terms of how their coverage will apply, but also for insurers to have the confidence in, in, in their portfolio. So in terms of what this might mean, I, I think we can all expect to see a stronger push in the market to, to adapt these existing exclusions in the next months and hopefully um, you know, achieve some clarity for, for, for both buyers and, and, and sellers alike. Maybe are you saying something different? No, in the interest of time, I would say, well said, Chris. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me wrap this up in a truly positive tone. Uh, I made a few notes as you were speaking. Uh, I read here now that uh, only maturing questionnaires is not going to solve the capacity problem. Uh, I hear words about innovation, technology, visibility, evidently capacity. Relationship among insurers that probably needs to be reshaped to deal with this uh, novel risk. And uh, I think that the four of us, the five of us in this room, are bullish about the future of the uh, cyber insurance business. Thank you so much uh, for joining me in this uh, webinar today. It's a luxury and uh, an honor for me to share this uh, time with you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for all the audience. I hope uh, you found value in this, uh, in this uh, extremely good conversation. And I hope, I hope to see you soon again. And um, everybody, please have a great weekend and stay safe. Thank you.